Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome back to the continuation of this week's study. <clears throat> As we return and consider more fully the verses that are before us, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance so that we might more properly apply that which we have learned and be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided these last days. As we come before you this morning, we ask for your continued guidance so that our minds may be open to this that we are studying. Help us now, direct us, so that in all ways and in all, in all things, we might be able to be prepared to glorify you. May our minds be receptive to re receiving the words that you would present. Guide us now, show us. May your spirit direct us. May your angels attend us. We thank you for these opportunities. We praise you for your patience with us. Help us now to go forward. Be with us in all things as we study and as we look to praise you. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, as we pointed out yesterday, this article was originally published on the second day of the 11th month. Now, as, as a note, once we have completed this portion, the next article, as you, now as you see, this article says right, right in front of us, second day, 11th month of the biblical year 5915. And of course, we know that there are three calendars that are in agreement on this particular day. Now, the portion of the study that is going to come after this was published on the ninth day of the 11th month of the biblical year 5915. So consecutively, we have two symbols, 211 or February 11th, 911 or September 11th. And these symbols we have been addressing as we have been proceeding as members of this movement. I find it interesting that these symbols have occurred in the way that they are. Now, is there anything that we have noted in times past when we are looking and we are seeing three calendars in agreement? Is there anything strange about that? What I find interesting is that when we're when we're dealing with a biblical calendar, a rabbinic calendar, and an Islamic calendar, all in agreement, that we don't see this happen very often. And the number of times that it happened, especially during the publishment of these articles by Smith, is going to require quite a bit more than man's intelligence. Now, yesterday, as we were addressing points, we were noting as we went through these verses, that Smith addressed a point of history. So we're going to go back over this point of history to introduce something that Brother Stephen showed us very offhandedly. So in verse 17, he shall also set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do, and he shall give him the daughter of women corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. Bishop Newton furnishes another reading for the verse, which seems to express more clearly the sense as follows. He shall also set his face to enter by force the whole kingdom. Verse 16 brought us down to the conquest of Syria and Judea by the Romans. Rome had previously conquered Macedon and Thrace. Egypt was now all that remained of the whole kingdom of Alexander, not brought into subjection to the Roman power, which now set its face to enter by force into that country. Okay, thank you. And in, in the chat, the comment is made, also the 24th day of the first month in Cyrus's third reignal year, when Daniel was by the Hittichel to view the thing, Daniel 10.4. We will get into this in just a moment. And there's a reason that we'll get into it in a moment. Ptolemy Eleuts died B.C. 51. He left the crown and kingdom of Egypt to his eldest son and daughter, Ptolemy and Cleopatra. It was provided in his will 
that they should marry together and reign jointly. And because they were young, they were placed under the guardianship of the Romans. The Roman people accepted the charge and appointed Pompey as guardian of the young heirs of the throne of Egypt. A quarrel having not long after broken out between Pompey and Caesar, the famous battle of Pharsalia was fought between the two generals. Pompey being defeated, fled into Egypt. Caesar immediately followed him thither. But before his arrival, Pompey was basely murdered by Ptolemy, whose guardian he had been appointed. Caesar thereupon assumed the appointment which had been given to Pompey as guardian of Ptolemy and Cleopatra. Now, <clears throat> during our conversation yesterday, it was noted that the Battle of Pharsalia had occurred, and I'm, I'm switching screens on another computer right now, it took place on the 9th of August of 48 BC, nearing near Pharsalus in central Greece. Here is Caesar with his own army coming against Pompey with the army of the Roman Republic. Now, do we see anything a bit strange in this? Is there a symbol that we can derive from this portion? According to history, this was part of the civil war of Caesar. Does that become clear to us? Now, what Brother Stephen pointed out in reference to the ninth day of August of 48 BC. Would, they, would Caesar be so sort of like in the north and uh, Pompeii in the uh, south? Well, let's remember Julius Caesar and Pompey Magnus had joined together in the first triumvirate. They had ruled together the Roman people. If they're in the middle of a civil war, then there is a faction on one side and a faction on another. So if I understand your question correctly, is this representative then of Caesar being a type of the king of the north and Pompey being a type of the king of the south? Is Am I understanding you right? That's what I was thinking, yes. Okay. Now, what was intriguing to me, and during the study, I just, I placed it, that this battle on the 9th of August of 48 BC took place on the biblical calendar on the 10th day of the fifth month. Brother Stephen pointed it out correctly that this gives an application with the day in which the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians because if we were to look at Jeremiah 52 12 we would find the following now in the fifth month in the tenth day of the month which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came Nebuzadaran captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon into Jerusalem and burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and all the houses of the great man burned he with fire. So on the 10th day of the fifth month, we wind up with the Babylonians destroying Jerusalem. Is this a major date in Bible history? Is this a major date in prophetic history? What say you? Yes, it is. And I, I just uh, saw that 586 BC is 538 years before 48 BC. So we have a 538 there, which is interesting. Now, <clears throat> what's also interesting, <laughs> when we look at this a little further, from 586 BC, if we, and, and here I would need Theodore Aran's or Stephen's assistance, but from 586 BC, if we were to go 586 years after 48 BC, it could bring us to 538, 539 AD. Does that establish a chiastic structure? Is this also not showing us 
that this indeed is Rome establishing the vision. It's fascinating. So here we have two factions of Rome, one led by Julius Caesar, an army of Caesar's troops coming against the army of Pompey, which was the army of the Roman Republic. This is a civil war, a war between two factions of the government. Now, Caesar, after finding that Pompey had been murdered, and Pompey was murdered the day before the date of his birth, Caesar thereupon assumed the appointment which had been given to Pompey as guardian of Ptolemy and Cleopatra. He found Egypt in commotion with intestine disturbances, Ptolemy and Cleopatra having become hostile to each other and she being deprived of her share of the government. Notwithstanding this, he did not hesitate to land at Alexandria with his small force, 800 horsemen, and 3,200 foot soldiers, taking cognizance of the quarrel and undertake its settlement. Troubles daily increasing, Caesar found his small force to be insufficient to maintain his position. And being unable to leave Egypt on account of the north wind, which blew at that season, he sent into Asia, ordering all the troops he had in that quarter to come to his assistance his assistance as soon as possible. Smith notes further. Okay, first I'll go to the chart. Okay, Matthew 12, 25, regarding divided kingdoms, houses, and cities unable to stand. So the point here is what? Well, the uh, conflict between Caesar and Pompey, you know, reminds me of, it's like Rome, Rome against Rome. And in America, when we had a civil war, <clears throat> in 1860 over whether or not slavery would be permitted. Was this not America against America? And in the situation with Israel, when they divided Israel with 10 tribes versus Judah with two, is this also not a house divided? Sure is. So here we're being given three sets of examples with all that's going on right now do we also not see that this same type of attitude the same type of division is currently occurring within the glor- the glorious land of today here we are whether it's been followed or not a couple of days ago the united states supreme court issued a ruling that basically strips special counsel Jack Smith's in supposedly independent group of most of what they thought they had found against former President Trump. And they have referred all of this back to lower courts. There are those currently in the government that are very appalled by this decision, and there are those that are supportive of former President Trump that are presently elated at this decision. The divide between one side and the other within America is widening. Now, we brought this up earlier in today's study. In these documents that we are examining, we have multiple calendars that are agreed as to their date. The biblical, the rabbinic, and the Islamic calendar are each agreed in multiple articles over multiple weeks as to the as to the date in which these documents were being published. Now, consider carefully the following. We have an example of the date when the temple was destroyed which occurred from Jeremiah 52.12 and is dated as being the 10th day of the fifth month. There is not a translation, a paraphrase, or other of scripture that disagree with this particular date. The 10th day of the fifth month has been set within God's 
scripture. It's also interesting that when we are looking at the date of this civil war between Caesar and Pompey, it takes place on the 10th day of the fifth month, according to the biblical calendar. Also, on the 10th day of the fifth month of the rabbinic calendar. So here we have two calendars in agreement. Now, it was shocking to me to note that this date where the Battle of Pharsalus takes place is noted as occurring on the 10th day of the fifth month on the Babylonian calendar. So here again, we have three calendars in full agreement. But there's nothing special about that, right? We have this battle between two former allies. Caesar defeats Pompey. Pompey and the army of the Roman Republic retreat into Egypt. Ptolemy, not much more than a young man, slays Pompey Magnus, the Roman general. Caesar, in assuming the role of Pompey, now assumes it in all manner that a Roman would take with a subjugated people. In the most haughty manner, he decreed that Ptolemy and Cleopatra should disband their armies, appear before him for a settlement of their differences, and abide by his decision. Rome is saying to two other parties that are not in agreement, that are having an internal civil war, not only is this brother against sister, this is husband against wife, which is very strange for me, but it means that Egypt was also in a civil war, just as Rome was in a civil war. Egypt being an independent kingdom, this haughty degree was considered as an affront to its royal dignity at which the Egyptians, highly incensed, flew to arms. Caesar replied that he acted by virtue of the will of their father, Aleuts, who had put his children under the guardianship of the Senate and the people of Rome, the whole authority of which was now vested in his person and his council, and that as guardian he had the right to arbitrate between them. What's going to happen in America if this comes to a division between liberal and conservative, what's going to happen if a third party comes in to say that this battle must cease? Will America listen to the United Nations? Under whose authority would a people such as America listen? Smith continues, the matter was finally brought before him and advocates appointed to plead the cause of the respective parties. Cleopatra, aware of the foible of the great Roman emperor, judged that the beauty of her presence would be more effectual in securing judgment in her favor than any advocate she could employ. Okay, now in the comment, in the comments, the following is stated there is also a doctrinal and policy civil war within the catholic church the traditional catholics regard francis as the antichrist now isn't that interesting that right now we have liberal versus conservative in america traditional versus modernist catholic and there is a division in both how else can we can we see this and apply it? We can see the parallel in our movement, too, where we want to stick with what Paul Monai is showing us and others don't. <clears throat> There's quite a bit that we are looking at right now. And yes, you are right, because we cannot come to an upper room experience. We cannot truly begin to give a message unless we are in unity. Would you agree? Now, here is Cleopatra. She's aware of the foible of this 
Ro great Roman conqueror. She's aware of the weakness of the man Caesar. As we covered yesterday, to reach his presence undetected, she had recourse to the following stratagem, laying herself at length in a bundle of clothes. Apollodorus, her Sicilian servant, wrapped it up in a cloth, tied it with a thong, and raising it upon his Herculean shoulders, sought the appointments of Caesar. <clears throat> now, when we're looking at this, and I'm I'm pulling this up very quickly because I want I want to ask a question. I'm looking here at the name meaning of Apollodorus. So this servant who is from Sicily. And where is Sicily? Does anybody know their world geography? Where is Sicily? Years ago in studying World War II, <clears throat> especially being made familiar of a lot of the battles of George Patton. I came to understand that Sicily was the island nearest the boot of Italy. So could we say <clears throat> that Apollodorus, her Italian servant, Apollodorus translates gift of Apollo. Now, keep in mind, Apollo was one of the ancient gods, okay? Was one of the Greek gods, I believe. So, <clears throat> Apollo was the god of war. So, here's Apollodorus, a gift of Apollo, her Italian servant. So, here is Cleopatra, Egyptian by adoption, Greek by birth. And thank you in the chat. It says, very interesting description of Apollo in Britannica. He is compared to a prophet. So here is this queen of Egypt who is born of Greece, carried upon the shoulders of a gift of Apollo by an Italian to a Roman, claiming to be a present for the Roman general. Apollo Doris was admitted through the gate of the citadel and entered into the presence of Caesar and deposited the beautiful Cleopatra at his feet. Caesar was far from being displeased with the stratagem and being of a character described in 2 Peter 2.14, the first sight of so beautiful a person, says Roland, had all the effect upon him that she had desired. Caesar, <clears throat> excuse me, could we say at this time, that Caesar had the morals of an alley cat. It is also pointed out in the chat that Apollo is connected with the sun. <clears throat> Caesar at length decreed that the brother and sister should occupy the throne jointly, according to the intent of their father's will. Pontheus, the chief minister of state, having been principally instrumental in expelling Cleopatra from the throne, feared the result of her restoration. He therefore began to excite jealousy and hostility against Caesar by insinuating among the populace that he designed eventually to give Caesar or to give Cleopatra the sole power. Open sedition soon followed. Achille, at the head of 20,000 men, advanced to drive Caesar from Alexandria. Skillfully disposing his small body of men in the streets and alleys of the city, Caesar found no difficulty in repelling the attack. The Egyptians undertook to destroy his fleet. He retorted by burning theirs. Some of the burning vessels being driven near the quay, several of the buildings of the city took fire, and the famous Alexandrian library, containing nearly 400,000 volumes, was destroyed. The war growing more threatening, Caesar sent into all the neighboring countries for help. A large fleet came from Asia Minor to his assistance. Mithridates set out for Egypt with an army raised in Syria and Cilicia. <clears throat> Antipater, the Idumean, joined him with 3,000 Jews. We addressed yesterday. Here's Antipater. 
one against the Father. He is an Edomian. He is of the Edomites. He is a descendant of Esau. Now, <clears throat> was Esau in favor of or against what his father Isaac had done regarding the blessing. Antipater, Esau's descendant, is joining Caesar with 3,000 of Judeans that have resettled in the Promised Land. The Jews who held the passes into Egypt permitted the army to pass on without interruption. So those that should have known better are now supporting the group that they are now that they will soon begin to despise <clears throat> without this the whole plan must have failed the arrival of this army decided the contest the arrival of the army of the jews decided the contest for Caesar, for Caesar. A decisive battle was fought near the Nile, resulting in a complete victory for Caesar. Ptolemy, attempting to escape, was drowned in the river. Alexandria and all Egypt then submitted to the victor. They submitted to Caesar. Rome had now entered into and absorbed the whole of the original kingdom of Alexander. When we are looking at this, historically. I don't know that we would have a reason to dispute it. Does anyone else have an idea on this portion for what we have just covered? <clears throat> now, by the upright ones of the text are doubtless meant the Jews. Okay. Okay. Contribution in the chat. After Julius Caesar, Caesar defeated Pompey at the Battle of Pharsalus, Antipater sided with Caesar during the Roman Civil War. During Caesar's Egyptian campaign, Antipater joined Mithridates of Pergamum's army marching to rescue Caesar in Alexandria. Caesar made him chief minister of Judea as Judah became known to the Romans with the right to collect taxes. Eventually, Caesar made Antipater's sons, Pharsalus and Herod, the governors of Jerusalem and Galilee, respectively. After the assassination of Caesar, Antipater was forced to side with the liberators against the Caesareans. The pro-Roman politics of Antipater led to his increasing unpopularity among the devout non-Hellenized Jews. He died by poison. The diplomacy and artful politics of Antipater, as well as his insinuation into the Hasmonean court, paved the way for the rise of his son, Herod the Great, who used this position to marry the Hasmonean princess, Marianne, endearing himself to Rome. Now, could we say that Antipater showed Herod how to be a political, shall we say, political tool? I didn't know the, it's interesting to find out who Caesar's father was. It was Antipater. Who, you mean who's Herod's father was? Oh, sorry, yeah, Herod's father, Antipater. Never heard his name before. History is an amazing study. And when we start putting the pieces together, and start seeing how these different actors had come on, come and left the stage and their effects, it begins to shock the mind. It's, it's uh, really neat to see the truth of uh, the truth that the historical application has to fit the interpretation. And once we get that right, we can use it to maybe try and see present day application, but it has to line up historically. Yes, so that, it does. That kind of keeps thing keeps a good pattern to follow. So, yeah, it's pretty neat. It's got to mean something being his father. 
the father of Caesar, who was such a terror to the church. Exactly. Now, Smith's opinion is by the upright ones of the text are doubtless meant the Jews who gave him, who gave Caesar the assistance already mentioned. Without this, he must have failed. With it, he completely subdued Egypt to his power in B.C. 47. The daughter of women corrupting her. The passion which Caesar had conceived for Cleopatra, by whom he had one son, is assigned by the historian as the sole reason of his undertaking so dangerous a campaign as the Egyptian war. This kept him much longer in Egypt than his affairs required he spending whole nights in feasting and carousing with the dissolute queen. But, said the prophet, she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. Cleopatra afterward joined herself to Antony, the enemy of Augustus Caesar, and exerted her whole power against Rome. So, here is Cleopatra as a symbol she is a representation of the king of the south. As a representation, as a woman, she is a representative of a church that is not upright. Is there anything else that we can see from this end? Okay. Now, verse 18. After this shall he turn his face unto the isles and shall take many. But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. War with Pharnaclus, king of the Sumerian Bosphorus, at length drew him away from Egypt. On his arrival, where the enemy was, says Pradu, he, without giving any respite either to himself or them, immediately fell on, and gained an absolute victory over them, an account whereof he wrote to a friend of his in these three words, Vini, Vidi, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. The latter part of this verse is involved in some obscurity, and there is difference of opinion in regard to its application. Some apply it farther back in Caesar's life, and they think they find a fulfillment in his quarrel with Pompey. But we think that preceding and subsequent events clearly defined in the prophecy compel us to look for the fulfillment of this part of the prediction between the victory over Pharnacles and Caesar's death at Rome as brought to view in the following verse. A more full history of this period might bring to the view events that would render the application of this passage unembarrassed. Now in the chat, we have Julius Caesar, civil power, unites with the apostate church, Cleopatra, to produce that child of the papacy, the Sunday law. I don't know that I would agree, only because I would look at it in this way. Julius Caesar, representative of Rome, unites with spiritualism because Cleopatra was a woman, but was a form of worship different from the church. So could this be the joining of two of the hands across the abyss? And could Antipater's joining with Caesar be the third hand? Okay, a further comment in the chat <clears throat> from one commentary. Antiochus plans to conquer Egypt by trickery. His daughter, Cleopatra, given in marriage to Ptolemy Epiphanes. This deal had the appearance of uprightness or equal conditions, but it failed. Cleopatra aids husband against her father. Antiochus invades Asia Minor and takes Aegean Islands. Roman general Scipio, 190 BC, causes Syrian reproach to Rome to return on his own. Antiochus overwhelmingly defeated. Verse 19, Antiochus, after returning to Antioch, a fort, is murdered by Elisimius 
by people for plundering temple to pay Roman indemnity, Roman taxes. Circumstances of death are controversial. Okay. And what commentary are we, are we referring to here? That's uh, uh, actually uh, Herbert W. Armstrong, who came out of the Worldwide Church of God, came out of the 1844 churches, right, that came up out of that time? They, they came out of Adventism. I believe. If I'm not mistaken, Herbert W. Armstrong came out of the situation that occurred after 1930. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm just not sure, but they seem to have Adventist ties somewhere. They're so similar in some things. I'm I'm not disagreeing with you. So it's just a one of the commentaries that I had a chance to look at. I, it's the top hit on Google, so. I haven't had time to look at the rest of them. Okay. Just throwing it in the mix. Right. Yeah. I remember quite well growing up where my father liked to listen to Herbert W. Armstrong. And then he listened to his son, Garner Ted Armstrong. So, all right. Herbert... That's the link there in the chat to the where I found that. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, Herbert W. Armstrong, after the birth of a couple of, of children, let's see, first, second, three, four. Okay. So, they, they wound up, Herbert W. Armstrong and his wife had four children, third of which was Garner Ted. They were living in Eugene, Oregon. They became acquainted with the, with a member of the Church of God Seventh Day. Now, the Church of God Seventh Day, a Seventh Day keeping Advent group that rejected the authority of Ellen White and her teachings, but yet accepted the Sabbath. That's where, that's how Gar, that, that's how Herbert W. Armstrong and Garner Ted Armstrong became acquainted with the Sabbath. So it's an interesting point. Okay. Now in the chat has now been posted a collection of Seventh-day Adventist commentaries regarding Daniel 11. It is interesting. And I agree from the comment last week that, or excuse me, the comment yesterday that there is quite a number of commentaries on Daniel 11 and there's quite a number of different opinions within the Adventist church itself regarding Daniel 11. So we were dealing yesterday regarding this, this partic particular word, the reproach. Sorry, Dwight, for the delay. No problem. Um, um, uh, interesting in the... Adventist commentators, the collection there. Okay. It's, it's either, either blank a lot of places or uncertain is put there. So it seems to be quite a bit of, yeah, it's, it's, there's no unity in the church, definitely on Daniel 11 and uh, uncertainty. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. As we had looked over the last several weeks, there is quite a difference of opinion in reference to Daniel 11 and in reference to Daniel 12. Even those that came to their threefold union that became known as Frida, that fostered upon the world questions on doctrine, none of those men of the church agreed as to how these passages should be interpreted. Today, we are in a situation. We know and can hear the footsteps of an approaching God. We are aware of the time in which we are living, yet we are not unified with other brothers and sisters. This last Sabbath, <clears throat> the 
American group hosted Elder Jeff, and he gave quite the discourse on the Philadelphian Adventist. Now, you may wish to listen to what he had to say. I was intrigued for a few reasons, but it was the timing of our study this week that took the most of my attention. Please be aware that what Elder Jeff had stated was that he and Colin were not in full agreement with each other. Yet he believed enough in what Colin was saying that he thought that they could reason together without being unreasonable to each other. That's good. It is. We have, but we have a lot of things that we need to address yet. It, it would be nice if the same same uh, reception was afforded everybody. I very much agree. Just, yeah, interesting. And I was wondering too, you know, with so much, uh, so many opinions. It's almost like the church coming out of the wilderness. Um, and so why are there so many opinions? One, I suppose I'm thinking of is starting from different premises. So if everyone could start from like we're doing here is really, I really appreciate it. It's, it's methodical, it's slow, and it's not rushed. And, and questions are welcomed and encouraged as well as contributions from anyone and just, you know, sorting it out, tossing it like a tossed salad, picking through and getting out the olives you, you like or something. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you what, my you brother, should, you, you can have all the radishes. <laughs> all right. Especially the ones from the garden. Nice and nice and hot. <laughs> <laughs> but just a few. <laughs> That, that that's one vegetable. As a child, I never could I I never could enjoy, and as an adult, the only ones I really will partake of are the daikon from Japan. So, okay, they're are they mild? They're they're just a different, totally different texture. I mean, the, the first time I had to eat a radish as a child, I mean, my father was enjoying them so much, so was my mother, and. It was just something that was so strange to me. I could not take it. Was it the one thing on your plate you were allowed not to eat? Every kid gets one. You pick uh, radishes? No, my, my mother was always very direct that she didn't give us much. When, when we didn't serve ourselves, she would give us just certain things, but we had to eat one bite of everything on our plate. I was not allowed to avoid radishes. That's fair enough. Yeah. Two choices on the menu when mom makes dinner, take it or leave it. Um, <clears throat> no, when mom would make oh, the dinner, leave it. <laughs> it, it was again, back to the one bite rule. Mm-hmm. So well, the problem I had w w was mushroom soup, and it tasted like little bits of rubber, and I gagged on it, so I, I just couldn't. I would gag on it, like couldn't eat it. Okay, hey, brother Dwight. Yes, brother. Do you know what the uh, what they was discussing about? Is the same thing we've been discussing. Exactly. You know, Collins and Jeff, they was discussing who was a, uh, who was a robber of the people, I think it was. But... Agreed. Yeah. The wrong always established the vision of what, the, what they was discussing. And at one time, Collins thought the U.S. The US was um, with it. That is correct. And I believe that Colin is holding to that position. And Elder Jeff has been very, very direct that the robbers of thy people must be Rome. Because as he was stating, that Rome establishes the vision. Now, in this situation, 
Colin was not taking the full position of Uriah Smith, but he was taking the spirit of the position of Uriah Smith. Because Uriah Smith's attitude during the latter years of the 1870s was that Islam, or as he puts it, Turkey, had to be the king of the north. And James White was very direct that Rome was introduced in Daniel 2. It was reinforced and introduced again in Daniel 7. Therefore, Daniel 11 must involve Rome. And Elder White was very intractable to this, to the point where when Smith gave his discourse on the Eastern question, as he saw it, involving Turkey, the next discourse by Elder White was to state that that was not possible and that it was Rome, not Turkey, that would be the king of the north. As we have addressed at other times, Sister White told her husband directly that he should not be offering public disagreements with other brothers. Yet I find it, I find it uh, interesting how they did do that. Like then one would give a sermon, someone in the congregation would get up and give another discourse on their opinion. And it, I don't know how long their, their church services were, but I, I heard that that's how they would do it. Say Smith would give his and Elder White would stand up and give his at the same time, or like you were saying, following. So, but yeah, public uh, turns into a public debate, I guess. Right. That's not good. Now, in our situation, well, you know, I thought it was I thought it was not interesting that both of both. The American and in our in our group was uh, studying the same verb. Right. Anyway. Well, Brother William, this is why I'm bringing this up the way that I am. The timing. And yet another. Go ahead. And yet another example of yet another example of the fractured commentary on Daniel 11. I mean. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no. As you pointed out, we are welcoming input, comments, and we're, we're even welcoming alternative lines of thought. Now, I'm not going to say I agree with all of it, but we're going to welcome it because we have to be able to examine these things. We have to be able to examine these points without coming to an attitude of, well, we need to throw this person out. We need th this person shouldn't be here. It's like, it reminds me that the sign of a, something to do with a strong mind or a strong, some kind of a mind that is able to entertain opinions and ideas that are contrary to our own without um, accepting or rejecting, but be able be able to just entertain them and consider them now, right it's not easy when things come again come come out of the blue against our paradigm and it is going to shift things it's it's a careful process but it needs to be done if it's not done we wind up with people like herbert w armstrong seeing a portion of truth but not able to see the whole truth now in my career, I've encountered many different people. I remember one day that I was asked to meet with a factory rep. Now, it's interesting because this factory rep was an adherent of the teachings of Herbert W. Armstrong. He had been through Armstrong's college. He wore a ring of that college to identify his attendance. Now, this factory representative was very adamant 
He was trying to tell me how to do things. He was trying to tell me exactly what I should be doing, how I should be doing it, why I should be doing it. And he was very animated, almost to the point of pounding on a table. Now, I looked at this man as as he is becoming more and more <clears throat> emphatic. And I asked him, as he's trying to make his penultimate point, so do I understand it correctly that you keep Sabbath? And it was like I had simultaneously slapped him and dumped a five-gallon bucket of very cold water on his demeanor changed immediately, and he didn't understand from there how to approach things with me. And for the years that remained, he couldn't figure out how to have a conversation with me because I was asking him if he was indeed keeping the Sabbath. Now, for us to be you know, very correct or very direct, excuse me, those that chose to accept the teachings of the Worldwide Church of God also hold that they must keep to all of the feasts of the Jews. And they will have, and they will do no business during a period of those feasts. It's a point where we would not be able to fully agree with them. We're having these conversations, these studies. The original premise was after July 18th of 2020 to return to the scriptures to find out where, if anything, the premise was incorrect. We are currently looking and willing with open arms to accept any that will come that will are willing to study these matters out. There are many that have decided that they cannot bear anything having to do with numbers, anything having to do with history, anything having to do with chronology. And they wish to cast out those that look to this. Now, today's opening statements. Here again, 10th day of the fifth, of the fifth month, the date in which the temple was destroyed, established by scripture. 538 years later, Battle of Pharsalus between Caesar's army and the army of the Republic of Rome. Yet from that date, 586 years later, we come to the date of pagan Rome's ascendancy upon the earth. Are there anything in scripture, anything being presented from either of the charts that is not according to God's will. Where? Is Here anything what we're reading? All, all of it, all of it was God's will. I'm wondering, curious, Dwight, uh, yes. going through some of the emails there. Yes, sir. Uh, saw one of yours from July 28th, and you sent a letter out inviting discussion on July 18th and whether we, we should... Uh, repent of it back in 2020 so here we are four years later i'm wondering was there much of a response to that from the parties you sent it to yeah it took me four years to find it again and read it actually <laughs> well i was not in a good place at the time i i understand to to explain very directly um i sent the letter I received an invitation. I went back to a a meeting because the, the first time that, that you and I physically met was, of course, mm -hmm. down, down there in Bonnerdale, Arkansas, right? You remember which, which time that was? I went uh, three times, I think. I think it was the second time we met, uh, 2017, maybe? No, this was 2019. Third, 19. Oh. I went in 2019. Well, there you go. Good memory. Now, I wound up going. So I was there when both of y'all was there. Okay. I, I met, I met, uh, Kelly. I think I met you too. I just didn't, I just can't remember right offhand if I did or not. 
I, I'm pretty sure that we met there, William. It's, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I'm in agreement with you. I'll have to go through my photos. Uh, I took pictures, often selfies, with people, so <laughs> I haven't been able to find all of them. I, I remember Elder Jeff making the comment that you were his selfie-taking brother. Yeah, and uh, who was it uh, from from Canada? Uh, starts with an R. Uh, which we call it Son Temple. Uh, Pat Rope. Temple's son. Rope. Yeah. And uh, the first time I met him and the first time I met Jeff, he was picking, said he went to pick Jeff up at the airport on the way back to camp meeting. He gave him a heads up that when he got there, he was probably going to have to suffer a selfie with Kelly. <laughs> Jeff wasn't much into that, eh? <laughs> right. No, the, the I've, got, I've, got, I've got so many pictures of him and me in selfies. <laughs> it's, well, it's, I got to put them together in one place one time. When when we went and met in 2019, I went later after July 18th, 2020. The letter was not well received. It was received. I wound up going back down in 2020 for a meeting. And what wound up being the entire purpose of the meeting was whether the decision was going to be to find a way to stop Theodore from presenting using FFA's Zoom meetings. And I wound up alone at that meeting stating that I believed that this was a mistake, that we should not be casting out other brothers and sisters that may have a difference of viewpoint from us. Mm -hmm. By the time the decisions were being addressed on December 6th of that year, it was not even more than a day after that, that I, along with several others, were removed summarily from any access to any kind of meetings that FFA was doing. Mm -hmm. So the letter to say we need to study together fell very much on deaf ears. Mm. Well, it certainly remains as a witness. Sure. It's something else, how people were were treated. They, I guess there was so much deception going on with the division that happened, well, with all, almost the loss of Future for America. Um, yeah, that there was so much distrust of everything that they closed ranks and unfortunately never opened again. Right. Okay. We have now come to the close of of today's study. We have presented several different points for consideration. There's things that I'm still looking to try to place onto a line. Does anybody else have any other thoughts, comment, or question from what we're talk what we've talked about today? I was thinking uh, um, re remembering uh, something that I shared on Sabbath about signs of affirmation from God that I was on the right track and talking with another friend we remembered uh i think it was was it odilio or stephen who went out into the woods to pray about whether they should reject july 18 he was under pressure went out into the woods looked up and saw 187 on the bird bird thing i remember the i Melton. remember the witness i don't remember who it was ron says odilio yeah. okay went out into the woods looked looked, looked up saw 187 in my case I had misremembered seeing when I saw the plate, the Jeff. It wasn't during the division time, our 187 crisis or whatever. Right. It was uh, It was actually during my disfellowship in 2013. I was praying, should I, which way to go? And, and God told, told me, you know, stay with the 2520, the Jeff. That's where I was getting a lot of my understanding from. Right. And, and so I stood was disfellowshipped, went to work the next next day that week, taking a measurement. My friend, one of my friends reminded me of this, actually. Um, went to work and we're taking measurements and he shows out the measurement, 2520. I asked him to repeat it, 2520. I'm, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then uh, um, 
that week going to camp meeting as I had for 20 years in a row and walking in and seeing the charts. So there was three, three things that God confirmed to me that 2520, I was on the right track and stay firm. And the, the other thing was uh, I thought of when we were discussing 187 or some of the things that we consider as, uh, I guess, confirmations that, uh, that it was something in it that God was in it, or the sale of the school and so on. I thought, that, thought again about the money being returned, all of it, and then being doubled because the newspaper gave the same amount to Islam. Right. So that kind of thought that was an interesting detail. I'd like to add that somehow to that uh, video there. I'll put something together and put it in the comments because uh, I don't want that to be something that people might think that, you know, I chose Jeff over Parminder because really I stayed neutral and uh, just watched it unfold. And of course, I, I can see who was right, but I hadn't had time to settle the question for myself. All I knew is that the 2520 was true and surrounding subjects that we were studying were all right up to that point. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. It wasn't a sign to follow Jeff. It was a sign to follow the 2520 and take my stand and, and be disfellowshipped. Because in that same reading that day, I, I, Ellen White several times makes a point to not follow one man or wait for one man to give the interpretation of the truth. Amen. And I see that happening. I see that happening. It's just beautiful. These studies, you know, Theodore is very dear to us and he, he knows so much and we really like to hear him explain things. But to be here today and just talking, you know, just talking about it. Having a conversation. I'm not trying to defend, not trying to defend a our, our certain point or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have spent together. We thank you for your guidance, for your direction, and for your blessings. Be with us today in all things. Direct our steps, direct our thoughts, so that which we do may come to glorify you. I thank you for each that have been in this study and for those that will view this later and ask a blessing upon their day and upon each one. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus name. Amen.